Mr. Way, will you please stand? You know, I grew up and served my time in the Army during the Cold War. If there's one thing I learned, communists almost always lie. The biggest lie that they tell is to think that they speak for 1.4 billion people who are surveilled, oppressed, and scared to speak out. Quite the contrary. The CCP fears the Chinese people's honest opinions more than any foe. And save for losing their own grip on power, they have reason, no reason to. Just think how much better off the world would be not to mention the people inside of China. If we had been able to hear from the doctors in Wuhan and they'd been allowed to raise the alarm about the outbreak of a new and novel virus. For too many decades, our leaders have ignored, downplayed the words of brave Chinese citizens and warned us about the nature of the regime we're facing, and we can't ignore it any longer. They know as well as anyone that we can never go back to the status quo. But changing the CCP's behavior cannot be the mission of the Chinese people, and free nations have to work to defend freedom. It's the furthest thing from easy. But I have faith we can do it. I have faith because we've done it before. We, we know how this goes. I have faith because the CCP is repeating some of the same mistakes that the Soviet Union made, alienating potential allies, breaking trust at home and abroad, rejecting property rights and predictable rule of law. I have faith, I have faith because of the awakening I see among other nations that know we can't go back to the past in the same way that we do here in America. I've heard this from Brussels to Sydney to Hanoi. And most of all, I have faith we can defend freedom because of the sweet appeal of freedom itself. Look at, look at the Hong Kongers clamoring to emigrate abroad as the C CCP tightens its grip on that proud city. They wave American flags. It's true. There are differences. Unlike the Soviet Union, China is deeply integrated into the global economy. But Beijing is more dependent on us than we are on them. Look, I, I reject the notion that we're living in an age of inevitability, that some trap is preordained, that CCP supremacy is the future. Our approach isn't destined to fail because America is in decline. As I said in Munich earlier this year, the free world is still winning. We just need to believe it and know it and be proud of it. People from all over the world still want to come to open societies. They come here to study. They come here to work. They come here to build a life for their families. They're not desperate to settle in China. It's time. It's great to be here today. The timing is perfect. It's time for free nations to act. Not every nation will approach China in the same way, nor should they. Every nation will have to come to its own understanding of how to protect its own sovereignty, how to protect its own economic prosperity, and how to protect its ideals from the tentacles of the Chinese Communist Party. But I call on every leader of every nation to start by doing what America has done, to simply insist on reciprocity, to insist on transparency and accountability from the Chinese Communist Party. It's a cadre of rulers that are far from hom homogenous, and these simple and powerful standards will achieve a great deal. For too long, we let the CCP set the terms of engagement, but no longer. Free nations must set the tone. We must operate on the same principles. We have to draw common lines in the sand that cannot be washed away by the CCP's bargains or their blandishments. Indeed, this is what the United States did recently when we rejected China's unlawful claims in the South China Sea once and for all, as we have urged countries to become clean countries so that their citizens' private information doesn't end up in the hand of the Chinese Communist Party. We did it by setting standards. Now, it's true, it's difficult. It's difficult for some small countries. They fear being picked off. Some of them, for that reason, simply don't have the ability or the courage to stand with us for the moment. Indeed, we have a NATO ally of ours. Uh, that hasn't stood up in the way that it needs to with respect to Hong Kong because they fear Beijing will restrict access to China's market. This is the kind of timidity that will lead to historic failure. And we can't repeat it. We cannot re repeat the mistakes of these past years. The challenge, the challenge of China demands exertion, energy, 
from democracies, those in Europe, those in Africa, those in South America, and especially those in the Indo-Pacific region. And if we don't act now, ultimately, the CCP will erode our freedoms and subvert the rules-based order that our societies have worked so hard to build. If we bend the knee now, our children's children may be at the mercy of the Chinese Communist Party, whose actions are the primary challenge today in the free world. General Secretary Xi is not destined to tyrannize inside and outside of China forever unless we allow it. Now, this isn't about containment. Don't buy that. It's about a complex new challenge that we've never faced before. The USSR was closed off from the free world. Communist China is already within our borders. So we can't face this challenge alone. The United Nations, NATO, the G7 countries, the G20, our combined economic, diplomatic, and military power is surely enough to meet this challenge if we direct it clearly and with great courage. Maybe it's time for a new grouping of like-minded nations, a new alliance of democracies. We have the tools. I know we can do it. Now we need the will. To quote scripture, I ask, is our spirit willing, spirit willing, but our flesh weak? If the free world doesn't change, doesn't change, communist China will surely change us. There can't be a return to the past practices because they're comfortable or because they're convenient. Securing our freedoms from the Chinese Communist Party is the mission of our time, and America is perfectly positioned to lead it because our founding principles give us that opportunity. As I explained in Philadelphia last week, standing, staring at Independence Hall, our nation was founded on the premise that all human beings possess certain rights that are unalienable, and it's our government's job to secure those rights. It is a simple and powerful truth. It's made us a beacon of freedom for people all around the world, including people inside of China. Indeed, Richard Nixon was right when he wrote in 1967 that the world cannot be safe until China changes. Now it's up to us to heed his words. Today, the danger is clear, and today the awakening is happening. Today, the free world must respond. We can never go back to the past. May God bless each of you. May God bless the Chinese people, and may God God bless the people of the United States of America. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Please be seated. Um, I'm Hugh Hewitt, the president of the library, and Secretary Pompeo graciously invited some questions as I was listening. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Secretary, at the Nixon Library. My first question has to do with the context of the president's visit in 1972. You mentioned the Soviet Union was isolated, but it was dangerous. He went to uh, the People's Republic of China in 1972 to try and ally and combine interest with them against the Soviet Union. It was successful. Does Russia uh, present an opportunity now to the United States to coax them into the battle to be relentlessly candid about the Chinese Communist Party? So I do think there's that opportunity. Um, that opportunity is born of the relationship, the natural relationship between Russia and China. Um, and we can do something as well. Um, there are places where we need to work with Russia. Today, or tomorrow I guess it is, our teams will be on the ground with the Russians working on a strategic dialogue to hopefully create the next generation of arms control agreements like Reagan did. Uh, it's in our interest, it's in Russia's interest. We've asked the Chinese to participate. They've declined to date. We hope they'll change their mind. It's, it's these kind of things, these, these proliferation issues, these big strategic challenges that if we work alongside Russia, I'm convinced we can make the world safer. And so there, I think there is a place for us to work uh, with the Russians to achieve a more likely outcome of peace, not only for the United States, but for the world. President Nixon also put quite a lot of story in personal relationships over many years with individuals. Uh, that can lead wrong. President Bush famously misjudged Vladimir Putin and said so afterwards. Uh, you have met President Xi often. Is the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party someone with whom we can deal on a transparent and reliable basis, in your opinion, based on your personal diplomacy with him? So the meetings that I've had and the meeting that the president we've had, they've 
They've been good, frank conversations. He is the most powerful leader of China since Mao. Uh, he has also, in, in many ways, uh, deinstitutionalized the Chinese Communist Party, uh, thus giving him even more capacity and more power. Uh, but he, I, I think the way to think about it is how I, I spoke about this today. Uh, it's about actions. And so how one evaluates one's counterparts sitting across the table from them uh, is important to think about how you can uh, find common understandings and make progress. Uh, but in the end, uh, it's not about what someone says or the agreement that they sign, but are they prepared to, to, to lead, to do the things that they committed to? Are they affair, uh, prepared to fulfill their promises? And we've watched, uh, we've watched this China walk away uh, for their promises to the world on Hong Kong. We walked their, uh, General Secretary Xi promised President Obama in the Rose Garden in 2015 that he uh, wouldn't militarize the South China Sea. Google, Google the South China Sea and arms, you'll see another promise broken. So in the